So thank you for having me back. Um, I'm, I'm the second string. So Christian Weiss was supposed to be here to give you phenomenal lectures on the election, Electron Ion Collider. And unfortunately you get me, um, but I'm only an hour and then you get two phenomenal other speakers. We got FX coming after me. He's going to get into the science of the Electron Ion Collider. And tomorrow you have Yulia and she's going to tell you all the details of the latest and greatest iteration of the EPIC detector. To get things started, I'm gonna give you some history. So you have some knowledge of how the heck we even got to an electron ion collider and a little bit about project and some of the jargon uh, that gets thrown around with project like CD1, CD2, what does that mean? So hopefully by the end of this talk, you have a little bit of knowledge on the history of the electron ion collider, why is Jefferson Lab still involved, and project. Um, and one thing I hope I made clear on my first talk to you all is while the electron ion collider is coming, it's cool, it's going to do all kinds of awesome science, there's a lot of awesome science to get done here. There's a decade plus long program with fixed target experiments. And what I can do at a collider and what I can do with fixed targets are different in many ways. The kinematics I can get to, luminosities I can get to. Um, still lots of cool ideas. And for those of you who will still be here, uh, last week in July is our program advisory committee meeting. That'll be in the auditorium. It'll be all week long. And this is where the scientists, the professors come here. We have 14 new proposals that they're going to defend. It is interesting, at least when I was your age, I remember coming to see program advisory committee meetings. And yeah, we're on 51. I'm 53. Anyway, so I guess I could have been at the first one. Um, I would strongly encourage those of you who are interested in pursuing a career in science, see how that goes. Just see the dynamics of presenting experiments, defending it. It's pretty interesting. Uh, so we got eight standard experiments and something really new and different for Jefferson Lab. Uh, we have six positron proposals submitted. Um, reverse the polarity of all the dipole magnets in the machine, have a new source, do positrons instead of electrons. This is a very interesting new frontier for our machine. Uh, it should be possible in the far future to have positrons at EIC, but that would be challenging. So really, through the 2030s, uh, Jefferson Lab is going to be the place for high luminosity, high energy positrons. And anyone who's interested, there's a big topical collection on that. Beyond that, there's also ideas for increasing Jefferson Lab's energy uh, to 22 GeV using permanent magnets. This whole idea is incredible. So using standard electromagnets, there's really no way you're going to get past 12 GeV. Extremely challenging. And people have come up with a wickedly cool idea for using neodymium and these other incredibly strong magnetic fields or magnets, make permanent magnets that actually run the same beam through multiple orbits within one aperture. Pretty wild, neat way to upgrade the lab. So, so from an accelerator point of view, this is... Pretty exciting, cutting edge. All right, enough on JLab. I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on electron ion collider, give you some ideas on lectures. And I mentioned before, I've got two speakers following me, give you a lot more details. So before I get to the EIC, we're going to take a little bit of a step backwards in time and mention HERA. This was the first of the high energy electron proton colliders in Germany at DAISY. Relatively high energy, so 27.5 GeV electrons, 920 GeV protons. Keep these numbers in mind. You'll actually notice that the future electron ion collider is not going to get this high in center of mass energy. It will be lower. This machine ran 92, 2007. 
They made use of a really cool phenomenon called Sokolov turnoff to get polarized electrons in their machine. And this is just simple. You do nothing. If I take a beam of electrons and circulate it in a storage ring in strong magnetic fields when it emits a hard photon, it, that happens in a preferential direction, and you'll start to build up polarization along the field lines of the dipole magnets. So just letting your electron beam circulate, high energy, this process happens relatively quickly. So within an hour, I can have built up 60, 80% electron polarization. It's in the direction of the magnetic fields of the dipoles. So they put in spin rotators, whack it down, go through the target area, flip it back up, circulate. So this allowed Hera to have highly polarized electrons. And it went along with their high energy. So the this Sokolov turnoff process scales with energy, so it happens faster. So the problem at low energy isn't that it doesn't happen, it's that it happens so slowly that the beam would die away before you ever build up any significant polarization. So this was an amazing machine. It still has publications. If you go to the archive right now, you can find papers coming out from Hera. So especially on deep and elastic structure, structure functions, inclusive measurements in particular, world-class to this day data. So great, there was this Hera thing, made lots of data, people still looking at it. So why do I need EIC? Luminosity. And I come back to this term a lot, whether it's Jefferson Lab or EIC, a lot is about luminosity, the rate at which I can do an experiment. If it takes me a hundred years to do a nuclear physics experiment, you really think we're gonna get it done? I have trouble enough getting funding year to year. So two orders of magnitude in luminosity, that's the difference between a one-year experiment, a three-year molar experiment, versus a 300-year molar experiment. Yeah, no, nobody wants to run molar for 300 years, huh? nobody. That sounds funny, but that is the driving thing about EIC, luminosity. It's not gonna have the energy reach of Hera, but it goes up two orders of magnitude in luminosity. And we go from a machine that was really awesome for doing inclusive physics, so electron in, electron out, to a machine that's gonna be capable of doing semi-inclusive, multiple particle final state reactions, much less probable requiring that higher luminosity to get enough statistics to do meaningful science. So EIC is focused a lot on luminosity, and that just opens the door to all kinds of new physics you can do with the next generation machine that wasn't possible with this older machine, even though the older machine did have a higher energy reach. If you are gonna seek funding for a multi-billion dollar machine, you better have some pretty world-class scientific questions you're going after to answer. These are, the, these are not my questions. These are the key scientific questions that came out of the National Academy of Sciences report. So how did nucleonic properties such as mass and spin emerge from partons and underlying interactions? A lot of this is gluonic physics, mass low X physics this is where collider is ideal. We'll do a lot of spin physics with EIC. This is a place where EIC and Jefferson Lab complement each other. So if you're interested in both C quarks and valence quarks. How are the partons inside the nucleon distributed both in momentum and position space? So this is one of the topics I love, short range correlations. How do color charge quarks and gluons, jets, interact with nuclear medium? So A greater than one. So when I was mentioning here, I was talking about protons. The EIC, I can do heavy nuclear, I can do lead, whatever you like. How does a dense nuclear environment affect the quarks and gluons and their correlations? Again, getting away from the A equals one. What happens to the gluonic density and nuclei saturation? These are the big questions that EIC is to answer. This is again, reviewed, motivated by a National Academy of Science report. 
And the idea for electron ion collider, go back 20 years, people were starting to talk about building this machine and the science that we could do with it. And to give you a feeling for the kinematic coverage of electron ion collider, this is Q squared, so your form momentum transfer. You know, Jefferson Lab energies, roughly you're gonna get stuck around the beam energy for Q squared. So Q squared 10, here's Jefferson Lab. Yes, you can push above a little bit, but this is where we sit. And we also sit in the valence quark region. So a log scale, log, log scale, we're over here in the corner. Valence quark region and the EIC just completely opens up the C quark region, not only in X going to very low X. So, this is also where you're dominated by gluons, and you'll have a huge coverage in Q squared. There is a little bit of a lie on a plot like this, because when you see a plot like this, you go, oh, why the heck do I need J lab? EIC covers it. Great. Done. This is plot misses a dimension, and it again misses the dimension of luminosity or rate. And it's the reason that Jefferson Lab remains very relevant even in the time of electron ion collider and its luminosity. So I get into this region at Jefferson Lab, we can do luminosity to 10 to 38. I can do the Muller experiment in three years. Yeah, I see 10 to 33, 34. I don't have a million years to run molar, right? Luminosity matters, it matters a lot. So depending on your science or what you're interested in, yeah, if I wanna do this kinematics, I need to be at Jefferson Lab. Other science, this lower luminosity is fantastic and will do a phenomenal job at the lower X, these moderate Q squareds. And the connection at a very deep level between Jefferson Lab, Jefferson Lab scientists and the electron ion collider. This is really what I would call our physics, J Lab physics. This isn't the physics of an AA machine that's currently at Brookhaven. Rick, it's these Feynman diagrams electron in, electron out, inclusive, deep and elastic scattering, the semi inclusive scattering. So again, electron in, electron out. I mean, pion or other particle in the final state detected, and the exclusive reactions where you detect everything. These Feynman diagrams you can find in the proposals to the next pack. The kinematics that are being studied at Jefferson Lab are very different, tend to be in high X, valence quark region, EIC, C quark region. Nevertheless, the Feynman diagrams are the same. So there's a lot of scientific interest. Or I should say the scientists of Jefferson Lab have a lot of overlap in their interest to EIC and a lot of involvement. So there was always something very natural there. So what makes a lot many of us very excited about EIC is luminosity it can be reached. It is extremely challenging to reach a high luminosity when all you have are free beams. So I'm taking a beam of electrons, beam of protons, or other ions. I have to cross them. So Jefferson Lab, I make my beam of free electrons. I can put a target in there. I can take a gram of carbon, 10 grams. Muller, I have a meter plus long hydrogen target that we run the beam through. It makes it pretty easy to get to very high luminosities. At a collider, I have free beams of particles that I have to cross with each other. So getting to luminosity of 10 to the 34, while it sounds low compared to our 10 to the 38, 10 to the 39, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, when I did internal target physics uh, for my thesis at NICAF, so we had an electron beam stored, we could put an amp of current in that beam and we had a gas target. We could, with that, we could only get to luminosity of 10 to the 32. So no, it was no problem to have it up to an amp of current in the ring, but even with gas, the most I was able to get was 10 to the 32. This is amazing. They're gonna to get to 10 to the 34. They can have the electron beam, they can get to high electron currents, but they're gonna interact with free protons coming in from the other direction. So it is extremely hard. And they have one particular energy where they'll hit their peak luminosity, it's 10 to the 34. It's at 100 
GV, center of mass energy. So we're down factor of pi from Hera. Nevertheless, this is high enough to get science done. And I do love this, let's say, look at the science versus, oh, my machine can get to the higher energy. EIC really pushed back on that, made a science case. What's the center of mass energy we need? Around 100, 100 GV luminosity. We need the luminosity to do the multiparticle final state reactions. And the reason this curves is I hit different limits. The limit on the high energy side is a simple one. It's power. 10 megawatts of power is the most, the upper limit of power will be able to pump into the rings at the electron ion collider. So I'm just grouping here because I've hit 10 megawatts and I can't get above that without significant amounts of money pumped in. As you go down the other side of the curve, as I get to very low energy beams, it's actually very hard to keep beams together. So imagine I've got a pile of free protons sitting together. What do they want to do? Yeah, boom, right? So if they're not moving, if I just brought protons together, you know they're going to pull apart. Um, it's easier to keep them together as I get to higher and higher energies. Low, low energy, I get space charge limited. That's what rolls me down below luminosity. So I have a peak in the 34 at this 100 GeV center of mass energy. All right, this was a little bit of history. I think it's kind of fun for you guys to know it. And it's not that long ago. So as I go back to October 2019, so this is in the pre-COVID world, there were two competing designs for the electron ion collider. One was to take the, the facility at Brookhaven, so a machine known as RIC. It's an ion collider. Take it, upgrade it to have an electron ring. Jefferson Lab had basically the opposite idea. We already have an electron machine. So we'll, we'll build a ring to store the electrons and we'll add a brand new ion collider. Both of these designs could meet the requirements or answer the questions of the National Academy Science Report. Uh, they did have different say, characteristics that were special to them. Uh, for Rick, with a very large footprint, it, it was energy reach. Uh, Jefferson Lab had no way to compete with Brookhaven on energy reach uh, with this machine. The Jefferson Lab design, as you can see, is Kind of strange, it is not a circle like most storage rings. It's a figure eight. What is wickedly cool about the figure eight design is it's naturally spin preserving. So this design was set up from the beginning to do spin physics. So electrons, ions, able to easily store deuterons, um, spin one particle, very hard to manipulate in this naturally spin preserving design. Where in the circular ring, you can do it, but I need more and more Siberian snakes, so-called spin rotators to keep the polarization preserved. So one machine with energy reach, one machine designed with polarization in mind. They both could do the other. Rick certainly could have polarization. Jervis Lab could get to the energies required. And both created supporting documents. So it was December 19, when the down select was made. So both designs were presented to a review committee. It was decided, it became known to us uh, early next year, uh, what the result was and something called a CD zero. And on my next slide, I'll explain what a CD zero is. But in simple terms, this was a statement of need by the Department of Energy. And within that statement of need was also a site selection. What is historically significant about these dates and events? Normally, or traditionally, when a down select happens in nuclear high energy physics, the losing teams leave, they go away, do, do something else. We're done with that, wash your hands. This time was uniquely different and Anytime you're in a competition and you don't come out on top, you feel disappointed. That's human nature. What happened after this down select, we had the head of 
nuclear physics from DOE, come down here, Tim Hallman, and he gave a presentation here in our auditorium and he encouraged us to continue to develop, and it's almost quoting him, our intellectual ownership of the physics. So as I've already shown you, this Feynman diagrams, the science of the electron ion collider very much goes along with the science that the Jefferson Lab community does in general. And we were encouraged. Hey guys, yes, if you're disappointed, you would like to have that figure eight design. But you can stay with it. We were encouraged to. And this idea from Tim, as well as our laboratory management to stay involved really resonated. And it has turned into something uh, very positive and you would hope is the way science goes, right? I don't know, I'm probably an idealist, but in my mind, right? Scientists come together, they argue about, hey, we want this design or that design. And in the end, you have to pick something. And in my ideal world, after you pick, everyone would team up and we'd agree and we'd push on together. That is not what usually happens, but it is exactly what happened uh, with the electron ion collider. And by May, Brookhaven National Lab and JLab had officially signed a partnership agreement. And this not only is in place, but it is, we are fully immersed in not only the construction of the electron ion collider, but into the long-term science program of the electron ion collider. So this has been a great partnership. It is leveraging the knowledge and resources of the two labs. There are things that Jefferson Lab is better at. We do a lot of building of SRF cavities, polarized sources. There are things that Brookhaven is better at, building large-scale magnets, um, parts of their facility. So. Each lab is taking the pieces that they're good at and running with it, literally. All right, critical decisions. So if you, if you hang around JLab long enough, you'll hear oh, some experiment and keep picking on Muller. Muller, I think you have critical decision 3A coming soon. Yes, or just got, we just had it. You're not talking about that. Uh-oh, all right. All right, notice it's not even on the chart. All right, but what are the heck are these critical decisions? So I left the, daily, the Department of Energy order number off. It gets mind numbing, it's DOE order 420 dot blah, blah, blah. Who cares? What do I want to take away? So you will hear these numbers thrown out, CD0, one, two, three, four. Occasionally there'll be a letter added, which allows you to do special procurements early. Detail, big picture, CD0. This is the statement of need. So the Department of Energy will formally state that we need an electron ion collider to stay dominant in the field of nuclear physics. And the questions we're gonna answer are, as shown by the National Academy of Science. This is when you get started. This is when you start to get project engineering and design funds, and you are rolling, getting started. So this is what SOLID is waiting for. They do not have critical decision zero yet. We have Moeller up here somewhere. Each step in this process takes at least a year. It's just a practical, Every one of these steps requires many signatures, many reviews. The big milestones, as you hit critical decision two, this is where you're establishing your baseline budget. You're finishing up the design. So at this point, you should have a pretty good idea of what you want to build, how much it's going to cost. I hit full CD3. I'm now in full construction mode. I know exactly what I'm building. I have my design drawings. We're getting it built. CD4 is really your finish line. I'm allowed to start operations. So for the Jefferson Lab 12 GV upgrade that we just completed, we went through all these steps and CD4 was completed when we hit our key performance parameters. And then this was, Fairly modest, you know, some beam current hall C's, seeing some detect events in the various halls, 
And at that moment, DOE says, the project is complete. And this is where, as scientists, we finally go, Ooh, and we get to do our thing. It is no, from a scientist's point of view, this is where we get started. And this is where project ends. This table was just to visually show you how integrated Jefferson Lab and Brookhaven have begun. This is just one column in the project sheet from the electron ion collider. And for the detector piece, uh, there are co-directors, so our very own Rolf Entz and Elka from Brookhaven National Lab. They do that jointly. And if you look at the sub boxes for all the different detector subsystems, you'll see some BNLs, you'll see some J labs, it is completely integrated. And again, who is doing what really depended on the expertise of the different people involved. So tracking, particle identification, you'll see JLab, and you'll see people that just make sense. And the same is true uh, with calorimetry at Brookhaven. So you've got exactly the right people doing the right jobs. All right, this is a visualization of the change needed at RIC to go from their current machine to the electron ion collider. And yeah, we keep, let's see that make this thing go. All right. So presently, all hadrons, it can be protons, it can be lead, gold, you name it, they pretty much can accelerate it. And they're bringing those beams into their storage rings. They have two interaction points that are operational at the moment. You have star and Phoenix, star detector, the Phoenix detector, S Phoenix now, that can operate looking at ion collisions, proton, proton, gold, gold, proton, gold, whatever. So conceptually, the upgrade from this to electron ion collider is simple. Add an electron ring. And again, we'll keep two interaction points. So where star is currently, where Phoenix is, this will now be known as IP6, IP8, or the first detector. One thing you may notice that's funny on my picture is there are two electron injectors and not one. This is because Doug wants luminosity. And electron cooling works extremely well. So in order to achieve very high luminosities, I need the proton beam to be extremely well-defined. You can think of that as very low transverse momentum. So if my proton's moving forward, you can imagine it has horizontal wiggle, thermal motion. How do I get rid of that? A classical way to think of getting rid of that would be to have another beam next to it and have a classical collision. So bring the electron beam and electron beam at high current near the proton beam, they'll naturally collide and you will thermally cool the proton beam. You can have an entire science lecture on cooling and all the cool dynamics, but that classical process in mind of a, you're taking some energy out of the transverse motion of the proton by having a Collision with the electron, the electron will just get kicked out. It's nearly massless compared to a proton. It's actually a beautiful analogy. And it's what's going on. So they do, they do need two electron rings to make this work. One's going to be for cooling protons, one's to make our electrons. One problem, not a big problem, but a problem compared to Hera, the electron energies are relatively low. It would take a very long time to build up Sokolov turn off polarization. So instead of just letting electrons naturally become polarized, we'll use basically the same kind of source we have here at Jefferson Lab. We'll use strain gallium arsenide cathodes, polarized laser light, and we'll pull the electrons polarized from the source. So you immediately get your 85% polarization immediately and get going with your science. And they'll constantly re eject the Polarized electrons. Oh, all right, it works. 
It's one of the pro programs that's going on as we speak, and there's at least one Sully student in the room. As a student visualize how they further push luminosity. So I mentioned cooling. The bunches in the ion beam and the electron beam at the EIC, this is exaggerated, but they look like cigars. And if I cross two cigars with each other, I never get a perfect overlap. So one of the devices that we're adding into the beam is something called crab crossing. We take the bunch, we perturb the bunch along the beam line. There are quadrupole magnets here, which is why the beam doesn't fly off. But give that beam bunch per perturbative kick, it will start to wiggle. You set the wiggle up so the two beams exactly overlap. And then you take that wiggle back out. So crab crossing. This is the next way we get another factor of two in luminosity. This is the generic picture of an electron ion collider detector system. So in some ways, fairly simple. So at one of these interaction points, build up a detector system around the beam, got a free beam of protons, free beam of electrons, we're gonna collide them into each other. For those used to ion experiments, especially ion experiments where your protons are gold gold, so the same masses come to you, into each other, pretty much all the action is right in the middle. You can imagine I slam two things of equal mass into each other, it pancakes out. 90 degrees is central rapidity. Well, that's certainly not the case at an electron ion collider where I have this nearly massless electron colliding on my high energy proton beam. So the detectors look a bit different than our traditional um, detectors, star Phoenix. I do still have central detectors, but things change a lot because my electrons mostly scatter slightly. So I'll have electron end cap. And the same is true with the hadrons, hadron end caps. So a lot of the work, if you will, is happening in the end cap region. That doesn't mean the central part's not important. If I want to get all the physics, I need the entire dynamic range of the detector. But for anyone who does electron scattering, knows that as I go up in Q squared, you're still going up with this angle, my rates are going down, down, down. So as you get to these very high Q squareds, these are very improbable events. This is where you'll get all your early data. So this is the CAD model. This is an early CAD model. So Yulia will show you the latest and greatest version of this. So this very much looks like a barrel. It's a large barrel, but still a barrel. This is a beam pipe. So the beams have to be brought in together. One of the challenges of pulling this off, especially when I want high luminosity and I want high charges, I need my focusing magnets somewhere. So they have to be outside the detector region. So I have a many meter long detector. I need to do all the focusing that I can just before that detector, let them drift, beams drift and then capture them back and get them back into the ring with more focusing magnets. So one of the challenges that the engineers have as they're putting all this together is dealing with having very strong magnetic fields sitting very close to where we'd like to put all our detectors and then we need to add magnetic shielding, iron. So all kinds of considerations, weight considerations come into effect, how magnetic fields, stray magnetic fields could affect my detector and you have to put it all together it ends up this very tight package where in the very center you'll add tracking detectors. As you go out around here with all these different names, what was all this stuff doing? I'm doing tracking, things like Rich, Dirk. I can do particle identification. I can detect Trankoff radiation. What's Trankoff radiation? Yeah, when charged particle goes faster than the speed of light in the material. I love it. I always felt like a lawyer got involved with Trankoff radiation, right? You can't go fast to speed of light. And someone said, yeah, but what about if I'm in material? So, so yes. So, so when a particle is relativistic inside materials, it's a great way to tell particle types apart. So I use different types of materials, whether or not I see Cherenkov light, I can start separating out all the different particle types, pions from kaons. I can also do that with how much energy is left in the calorimeters. So when I'm done, 
the package will let me identify electrons, their scattering angle, their energy, the mesons, the hadrons, everything is coming out, all the different types, where it went. I'll know everything about the reaction. That's the goal of our detector. And to set the scale, so this is Natalie, a professor at UNH, back when she was a student a couple of years ago. This is the iron for what should become the solid magnet, was well, the Clio magnet. Oddly enough, the size of this is nearly identical to the EIIC detector one magnet iron, a natural scale. I love this just because you can see so from center of the detector to the outer radius is where I got pack all these detectors in. I've got radius of one human, pack that in. I also have to get it through the door. This was, it's always fun to look back on advantages and disadvantages. So when you had Jefferson Labs proposal for the IC, we were a green site. We were building everything from scratch. So the door was a non-issue. We'd make the door that would fit the detector. At Brookhaven, the door for IP6 already exists. And I can assure you it's extremely expensive to change the size of a door. I don't care if that's in your house, you just start doing new framing, um, but at a national lab, it is extremely expensive. If I want to start cutting, I need to get engineers involved. We're going to check the structural integrity. So instead, we designed that detector so it just snuggles through that door. And in the picture, you can see the end caps. So the way they've managed to fit the AIC detector through the door, the end caps will come off. They'll stay inside the room. The main detector slides out. This will allow you to service everything. You'll be able to get to those end cap detectors. And within the service room, you can start pulling detectors out, get to all the different detector types. And again, radius one here. So one thing that's really unique about the electron ion collider and something Hera just couldn't do uh, was far forward detection. One of the downside, first of all, hindsight is always 2020. So I'm, in no way putting down Hera and their scientists and their teams, it was awesome. In hindsight, the way they brought the electron beam to interact with the proton beam was a disaster. They bent the electron beam hard and then bent it back out, effectively making tons of synchrotron radiation. For doing physics in the far forward region, it was impossible because the synchrotron radiation was just blowtorching down the pipe. So they were not able to do anything in the far forward region. At the electron ion collider, they've been extremely careful that they bring the electron beam in gently. In fact, one thing that's not readily apparent from the pictures of the detector, the electron beam is what defines the axis. So I'm crisscrossing a proton beam and electron beam. You might naturally think, oh, it's all centered up. So an X with solenoid around it. No, the solenoid is tilted so that the electron beam is exactly on axis. So the electron beam doesn't get deflected, doesn't make the synchrotron light. The heavy proton beam doesn't make synchrotron light. So they've taken great care to mitigate a problem that we discovered in Hera, the synchrotron radiation, so that we can now make use of the far forward region. So now scaled down, this is that entire EIC detector. And as I look to the far forward region, so this is where the Ions have barely scattered, start heading. So you have your ion beam line, but we also put detectors just off of the axis. So we can detect those particles that have barely scattered. Uh, this is fantastic for deeply virtual Compton scattering, short range correlations, lots of experiments. And I'll give you one physics example of the far forward region being very cool and cool for science that we do here right now at Jefferson Lab, and that's going after deep and elastic scattering structure functions like F2N. How do I go after F2N? I don't have a free neutron target, so I'll typically grab deuteron, polarize it, or helium-3. I can get F2N, 
F1, A1N. So what do we typically do? So we just ran an F2N experiment, experimental Hall C, electron beam in, electron beam out. You can either just detect electron, keep elastic scattering, detect a meson with it, some inclusive DIS, and that's it. And while I would love for my electron beam to just interact with the neutron, of course, there are also two protons here. So most of the time it's interacting with the thing I don't care about and creates a dilution factor. And effectively what I'm measuring is A1 helium three. I will then correct for the protons that I've been scattering from. They also have a slight polarization and I jump from what I measure, to what I want to extract, fairly big difference in the asymmetry, making it much bigger. With an electron ion collider, you can do something almost magical. I still do my exact same reaction, come in, helium three target, electron beam in, out. But I can tag in the far forward region, the two protons that are left behind. So at Jefferson Lab, when I do this experiment with a fixed target, the spectator protons are just left sitting there. So imagine I come in, I strike a neutron very hard, it goes flying out or falls apart in deep elastic scattering, and I've got two protons sitting in the target. They don't make it out of the target. They have very little energy. They don't even make it through the glass or the aluminum of the cell wall. In a collider where the helium-3 is moving, to say the protons aren't struck, or barely interact, that just means they keep going forward with the beam. These each have charge one compared to charge two, so they'll nicely bend out as I go through the far forward region. I can detect the two protons, and by tagging the two protons, it becomes as if I had a nice free neutron target, and I really measure what I wanted to measure to begin with, A1N with far less corrections than we do it now. So, as the electron ion collider got CD0, we still needed to push, further refine the science case, further re refine what exactly we want to build. So it was during COVID to March 2021 uh, that we wrote a yellow report. In some ways, COVID oddly helped with this since we were stuck at home. What could we do? We could write so 902 pages, 400 authors, and my proudest achievement as a scientist, I got this entire document on the archive to compile. It only takes about 30 minutes, but it will compile. <laughs> you can get the source code. It's been published. I checked it today, so that's 544 citations already. It is quite a mammoth document. Um, if you're interested in various EIC physics or detectors that you hear from FX, Yulia, I, I would go to that document and just go to that section. But the part of this document is just fun to read. Um, people worked very hard, in particular Rolf Ent, uh, Thomas Ulrich, on making an executive summary. It's only about 20 pages. It is very readable. It gives a really nice high-level summary of the electron ion collider and the science case. So we're really flushing out the design. Like, okay, wow, we got CD0. What exactly do we want to build? How much tracking do I need? You know, how thick do my calorimeters need to be? You're, you're really starting to push that design forward. I haven't gotten to CD2 where I have to you know, start to get everything final. CD3 is where I'm building. So then I've got the engineers have made the drawings. So between two and three, you're, everything has to be flushed out. So we're, we're back a little bit. We're at CD0, getting to one. But still, you have to start firming things up fast. It comes at you faster than you might think. So jumping forward from when we did this, and this document was done as one community. That was the other thing that was nice. So we had done this down select, you know, there were still, we're humans, people wanted to win, lose, right? We feel good, bad. Writing this document really helped bring everyone back together. So this wasn't BNL authors or JLab authors. It was everyone interested in the electron ion collider working together on a common document What's the science we want to do? What do we want to build? And it did a nice job bringing us back together. Fortunately or unfortunately, there was a call uh, for 
collaboration proposals for the IC that was made. That was after the yellow report. A call was made to further refine what exactly we were going to build for the electron ion collider. In hindsight, this broke our community up again uh, into three teams. One was known as Athena. Um, this was a lot of star people. One called Eche, it was a lot of Phoenix people. One called Core, a lot of JLab people. There were certainly overlaps, but I made Venn diagrams. It wasn't as if it was just one group. It was just a dominant set. You, you could clearly see three different teams. And they came up with three different ideas for the EIC detector. Um, two of them were pretty close, at least at a glance. Eche and Athena, similar. They had differences, differences in size, differences in the details. Um, core, this compact design, was a little more different than the other, also a smaller team than the other two. But this caused another review. All three of the designs reviewed. And now I'm up to March of 2022, so not too far, only a year or so behind where we are right now. You know, which, which of these three would be chosen? And what happened at this point the committee preferred the ECHE design in principle, though there were many caveats to that. One of those caveats being ECHE by itself was by no means a large enough community to pull off uh, this scale detector. So the review committee, while down selecting the ECHE design, also said, hey, you guys need to work together as a team to really pull this off and also it was okay to refine the detector, at least within the parameters of the cost of the ETA detector. You know, if there's a better idea in Athena, you know, work together, make it happen. So almost up to today, uh, there's been a consolidation of the ETA and Athena collaborations. We now have something called Epic. Um, and the teams are now, again, very much aligned new working groups have been formed and taking advantage of the strength of those two collaborations and their pre preparation for the next level of review from DOE. And Yulia will go into these uh, more detail. In parallel to this, a lot of leadership from the core team is pushing ahead on the second detector. And again, please don't see these as fixed groups, it's, it's very much dynamic. People flow between Epic or some people are involved in both. This is just kind of at the high level you know, where, where the bulk of the groups gravitated to. I tried to find the updated reference schedule before the talk today, I couldn't find it. So this is from October 2021. It's not even two years out of date. This was the project picture then. So on this picture, we had gotten CD1. So up to here was fixed. So over two years, the schedule has slipped almost an entire year. So October 21, they were hopeful to get the CD2, 3A in April 2023. That hasn't happened, this is pushed out. That's the bad news. In any of these projects, tend to push the schedule as aggressively as they can, especially in the United States, because in the United States, the way we cost a project includes labor. In Europe, it does not. And that is an enormous difference. Think of it as your standing army cost. Someone like me or Rolf in DOE project, as long as I'm on that project, you're paying my salary. In Europe, they consider the salary of a scientist at a national lab a fixed cost and it's already off the top. But that accounting makes a huge difference in how much projects cost. So any delay, you're continuing to pay for the people. And people are the most expensive part of almost any project, not the stuff, people. Anyway, so the bad news is this has slipped. The great news was the Inflation Reduction Act. That, was in the news again recently as the House tried to pull the funding from it. That didn't happen. So Inflation Reduction Act included a lot of money for a lot of science projects. It included the funding for Mueller. It included funding to get EIC 
off the ground. So the things got a little delayed. This funding stream has started. So getting back on track. So roughly a 12 month delay, but it's not like it's just pushing out. Money has arrived and we are really rolling at this point. So everything on this chart is about from this point a year delayed. So early 2030s, if you're looking for beam uh, electron ion collider. Also on this chart was thoughts on adding a second detector. So within the project of electron ion collider, so this is what DOE has agreed to pay for, is the one detector, this EPIC detector. They have not yet agreed to pay for a second detector. So this was a timeline for a possible second detector, when it could be funded, how it could be funded. So people are basically imagining, oh, as the funding rolls off for the, the initial project, you then start funding a second tech. This does not yet have a critical decision zero. So much like solid people are looking for. So at present, and I checked this this morning, so the electron ion collider community, the entire community, so whether or not you're part of EPIC or a theorist, everybody, uh, 1,384 collaborators. Uh, just to give you a feeling, Jefferson Lab presently sits just under 2,000 collaborators. Um, EIC number is growing linearly by year, and I expect this will continue to grow. And this is a visualization of the fact that EIC has attracted interest from around the world. So Asia, Europe, United States, certainly very big players in the electron ion collider. And any of you all in this room are more than welcome to join this community, get on the main list. You have something known as your institutional representative. Uh, for Jefferson Lab, that's me. Um, each of your institutions has a representative, or at least I suspect everyone in this room is uh, institutions part of EIC, but if it's not, or if you have any trouble, just give me a holler. We can get you added to those lists and you can click this number up by one. Just quickly, I mentioned we, we have fellowships here at Jefferson Lab to help students get involved with EIC. I'll just flash these faces up. These are our current six fellows. Uh, we include undergraduate students, so theorists, experimentalists, actually a computer scientist um, getting involved with EIC. Uh, these are postdoctoral scientists working, so two experimentalists, theorists. Frank actually got another award, so he's gonna be moving here soon for an extended period, which is phenomenal. But there are opportunities to get further involved in EIC with, with fellowships like we have here. Uh, there are other ones available. And the final topic I wanted to mention our detector testing program. At Fermilab, other places, they have dedicated detector testing. You arrange in advance to get your detectors tested. Some places you pay to get detector testing. We don't have that here at Jefferson Lab. Nevertheless, we have tested many, many detectors over the years and have been testing EIC detectors, but we do it parasitically. So while the experiments are going on in the experimental halls, Scientists will often sit up in the corner on solid collaboration as a pretty big test stand in Hall C right now. Um, detectors they want to test, try out. Uh, we do have a small dedicated area with a 10 MeV beam, so-called upgrade injector test facility. These are spots, and I'll just show you a photograph of one of the test setups. This is an experimental Hall D, so this is a real photon beam coming in. Their big solenoid would be down here. Um, they put a thin foil in the beam, make electron-positron pairs, and this has turned into a gorgeous spot for doing detector testing. So what the scientists have laid out here is two gem tracking detectors to test and a modular rich detector. So ring, ring imaging Tarankov was put in the beam. Completely parasitic. They're literally off to the side. They can only go down the hall when the hall's having access for the main experiment. Nevertheless, over the course of months, you get many, many accesses, and as long as you're here and willing to be flexible, you can pretty much check out whatever you like with beautiful beams. So in summary, electron ion collider is happening. It got very nice funding, um, Inflation Reduction Act, so moving forward, and a very strong partnership has formed between Brookhaven National Lab, Jefferson Lab, make this happen, build the equipment, both for the detectors and the accelerator, the collaborations have also come together. Eche and Athena are no more. We have Epic. Uh, we still have teams working on 
possible second detector at the second location. And this will turn on sometime early 2030s. And I look out in this room, some of you in this room, you are gonna be the leaders, the ones running the experiments at this machine. Thank you. No, you're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> Hi, Doug. Hello. Um, so I think you had a fun picture of your detector set up before it like, or it lays out all the detectors there. Um, and I was quick looking at it, but I didn't say anything about tracking. Does that matter or is it just not labeled? It's just not labeled. Oh, okay. No, they're buried. In, so we're using silicon tracking detectors. Yulia will show you, but they're relatively small in scale. But yes, they're absolutely tracking detectors okay. in here. And, all right. Uh, um, what prevents uh, another collider from doing the crowding technique? Nothing. Okay. So the question was, why, why don't other colliders do the crabbing technique? Off the top of my head, I don't know what would prevent you. Um, it isn't cheap and it isn't easy. So I would say if you're not already current limited or have pushed all the parameters up already, you, this is not the first thing you would do. This is the, one of the last things you do. So for EIC, the cooling is not cheap. In fact, cooling is one of the items that may not be there on day one. So adding that extra electron ring to further the luminosity for the hadrons. Uh, on the other hand, since the crabbing, the getting these um, cavities in the machine at the right location really has to be part of the design from day one. This will likely be there. But it is, a, it is a very cute technique and it has been implemented at other facilities. This is not the first. It's just particularly challenging at EIC. Because like I have the I have this huge detector sitting here. So everything's far away. Yes. Hi. Uh, so when you showed the original design proposed by JLab, you said that the eight figure design was um, was good for spin physics. Can you explain, please? Uh, I don't have a beautiful picture, but let me explain why the circle is hard. That's perhaps easier than why the figure eight is easy. So if I take an arbitrary electron energy, let's just do electron, right? So I know I have an anomalous magnetic moment, G minus two. Right? There's even a nice experiment at Fermilab measuring G minus two to many, many significant digits. So I put a polarized electron beam in a storage ring send it around. So the momentum direction is changing. The spin direction will change relative to the momentum direction. Every 440 MeV of energy will spin faster. So at 440 MeV, it's naturally spin preserving. So the electron momentum would change, the spin vector would change. If I go up to 880, as the momentum vector changes 180 degrees, the spin goes 360. And this just keeps going up, 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 faster, faster, faster spinning and any spread in energy causes that to pull apart. So even that 440, right? I don't have a perfect 440 beam. I've got beams going around in a circle millions of times a second. So you can imagine even a small energy spread, this would slowly drift. The momentum vector and the spin vector drift apart, effectively it becomes unpolarized. So what we add into storage rings is something called a Siberian snake. Our it dates all the way back to the 1960s. Soviet Union scientists came up with the idea of, hey, regardless of the beam energy, as the electron's going around, so imagine I get halfway around, I'd have some opening angle. So momentum direction, spin direction will open up to something, flip it on itself. So that what a Siberian snake does is it flips it around so that when you come around 180 degrees, it comes back together, regardless of the energy. I don't know if that was probably a horrible visualization, but <laughs> it was a rotation 180 degrees around and then you come back in. And what is amazing about a Siberian snake is even if you're a little bit off in the energies or a little bit off in that coming around 180 degrees, every two times around it will preserve. It's a, naturally preserving as opposed to the ring alone, it will naturally come apart. So in the circular design, I need a lot of spin rotators, Siberian snakes to keep the polarization. 
spin one half is hard. A spin one particle like deuteron where the anomalous magnetic moment is very small. I need a lot of spin rotations, Siberian snakes, money, and it is not going to be possible in the beginning of the EIC to have deuterons polarized. On the other hand, in this figure eight design, as you track how that polarization goes, this naturally takes that flip. It basically builds it in with the figure eight instead of the circle. So it, it was a cute idea to do the figure eight. And in fact, if you look at what the Chinese are planning to do with their electron ion collider, assuming that it gets built, they're actually going with the figure eight design. I think if I was doing a green field design, you would always go with the figure eight. But that would have been extremely expensive to rebuild Rick. That was out of the cards. So at down select, we had to pick which one of these did we feel was the better overall design. If I'm picking for one particular category, sure, I'd pick one of the, it becomes very easy. But when you're holistic, costs, cost over the lifetime of the project, space, Jefferson Lab was really pushing the, we would be right up against the apartment complexes is where this fits. It barely fits on our site. And you can then worry about radiation and everything else. So this was a tough design. I liked it, but it was tough. I have a question for, for, for the audience. Um, that there is a second detector. Why, why would you go to all that um, trouble to do a second detector? Is that a good idea or not? Yeah, I mean, I guess to try to answer this question, um, the reason you wanted second detector is A, first, to cross-reference and calibrate the first detector. Um, two, because you could potentially put an entire detector or set of detectors in that are slightly different to explore different physics. Um, and three, which is kind of most interested to us here is it would be um, most related to JLab physics or, or similar interests if a second detector were being made, um, which gives us future careers. Oh, he's shaking his head. I got it wrong. You're, you're, I agree with your first two arguments, but this, um, I, I almost feel like that last argument has become, I don't know, rumor. I can do the Jefferson Lab, what? At least what I consider the Jefferson Lab physics uh, detector one, that far forward regions for range correlation. Yeah, I could do it even better given the secondary focus with the second, but it's not, this is not quantized like, oh, if I don't have the second detector, I can't do what I would consider the J Lab science. So, yeah, there's some things we can do better, but it's not quantized at all. I was waiting for you to fall into a trap and you didn't. One thing that the second detector doesn't give you at EIC that usually gives you. So at HERA, as they built more detectors, they're able to get more total rate. So naively you might go, oh, even if I made these identical, I'd win a factor two. At EIC, we pushed everything so hard that if I add a second detector, I actually have to reduce the luminosity at the first. I basically have hit the maximum luminosity that is possible and I would have to redistribute it. And this gets back to the space charge and everything else. I basically optimize everything for one, and there, I can't have another interaction region sharing or adding as it, it would be a destructive interference on the first. And what about the first two arguments? I, I, I like the first two arguments. The that first you two arguments are what? You can cross-check each other, and what, what else did you do say? Yeah, and this is absolutely the case. So especially as time marches on, so from, from my point of view, and I, I think I suspect this is the younger person's point of view, so I, I'm still in the younger camp. I'm actually cool with the idea that I, we build the first detector and the second detector a little later. The technology only gets better, all of it, the electronics, our tracking technologies, cool new ideas uh, for calorimetry, you name it, it all gets better. So you leave a little bit of time between number one, and number two. Number two will get cooler technologies, able to handle higher rates. Um, they, they are looking at something called a secondary focus, which will allow even more physics to be done that far forward region. Maybe they can get even closer to the beam. So yes, you'll open up opportunities. And I think a little bit of delay between two will actually be beneficial in the long run. Yeah, a lot of people liked on day one to have two detectors, but I think it'll be okay. I think actually it'll probably be opportunities for, let's say this room, Right, 
this detector is basically a done deal at this point. On the other hand, detector two, ew, almost a blank slate. I mean, there are ideas out there, but you know, if one of you all had that wicked cool idea for maybe a different geometry detector, I, I've seen some you know, ideas kicking around that really gravitate or people gravitate to can do new science. Yeah, make it happen. And and then you look at the at the at the history. So look at Star versus Phoenix, uh, epic fights at, 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 at uh, um, uh, how it's called. I used to go that the conference. Help me out. You don't know that the Heavy Iron Conference. Anybody here from Star of Phoenix or Rick or LHC Heavy Irons? No, but okay. I'm tired. I forgot the name of a conference that I used to go to. Uh, <laughs> And then you look at CF versus D0 Tevatron. Look at L uh, Atlas versus CMS. They always get the same observable <laughs> here and there. And, and then they fight, you are wrong or you are wrong, but no. And then they figure out how to do it right. So I, I think that, that that is big plus. Does not sell too well with, uh, with the funding agencies. They want to do it once, cheap once. Uh, they will never know if it is wrong, so it's right, and, and, and that's great. But I think it's a, it's a big argument for, for the second uh, detect. Okay, thank you, Doug, again.